Good morning, everyone. This weekend is Laity Weekend here at Glenmar, and my name is Paul Behrens. I'm the lay leader at Glenmar, and it's my pleasure this morning to come and speak with you. I don't speak in church very often. I have done a message once or twice in the past, but I'm pretty new at this, so um, the first time I spoke in church, I got some good advice from Joe Kirk, who many of you may remember was former lay leader here. Um, Joe and his wife, Joe's retired, and he and his wife Katie live in North Carolina now, but they do come back every so often to visit. And Joe said, Paul, there's only two things you need to remember. One is, it's a friendly audience. You're among friends, so don't be nervous when you speak. And he said, secondly, every single one of them is glad it's you and not them up there. (laughs) And I think he's right. Well, who's in charge? That's a question we don't ask very often. We usually know the answer to the question. Every Thursday afternoon, I take my daughter to soccer practice. We don't have to ask who's in charge. The coach is in charge. She gets out of the car, goes to practice. She knows the coach is in charge. He instructs the girls, teaches them skills, has them practice. We go to school. Youth, children, adults, we enter a classroom. We don't ask who's in charge. We know who's in charge. The teacher is in charge. The teacher instructs the students, gives them homework, helps them practice. We could be at work and walk into a conference room for a meeting. We don't ask who's in charge. We know who's in charge, most likely the person who called the meeting. And if not, then everyone looks to the most senior person in the room as being in charge. So we don't ask that question very often, who's in charge? But I think maybe we should. Because I think if we don't ask the question, it's easy to forget the answer. God is in charge. And I think that as Christians, we need to ask that question a little more often just so that we don't forget the answer. I'm convinced that God is in charge of my life, and I want to tell you a little story that uh, illustrates how I came to know that. Story starts on August 29th, 2005. Some of you may remember that's the day that Hurricane Katrina came ashore at the Gulf Coast. It clobbered New Orleans. It also hit the surrounding areas of Texas and Mississippi. I remember, as, as perhaps you do, watching on TV, uh, photographs of the destruction, the flooding, the chaos, hearing news reports on the radio for days, went on for days about the, the situation there. I found myself really being drawn and having to do something to help. Like many people, Tessie and I donated money to UMCOR, United Methodist Committee on Relief. UMCOR is a wonderful organization. We should be proud of it as Methodists. They have a reputation of being the first in and the last out. And they were there. They are among the first relief agencies there. We also organized the Girl Scout troops to make hurricane health kits, much like Glenmar did back in February. You recall we mobilized, we made over 800 health kits for the earthquake in Haiti. But despite contributing money and making health kits, I still had this tugging, nagging feeling I needed to do something more. So I started looking around for ways I could get personally involved. I called the Baltimore-Washington Conference to see if they had any uh, mission trips going there. And it was too early for volunteers. The first couple weeks was was still trying to get organized. I Googled a lot. I kept up with um, email, read every report I could find to try to find some way I could plug in personally and do more. Well, about the same time, D.C. Veal, our Minister for Youth, Young Adults, and Missions, was putting together a trip, a youth mission trip, to go to Slidell, Louisiana. Slidell is a suburb of New Orleans. It's on the north shore of Lake Pontchartrain. And what we were told is that houses as far as five miles inland were flooded up to the first story from the the hurricane and from the waters coming out of the lake. D.C. was able to put together a trip based in Slidell 
staying at Aldersgate United Methodist Church there. In fact, that church is amazing. Uh, they pledged themselves that for three years they would open up their church to mission groups. And it's actually in year five now, and they're still hosting mission teams that come down. Wonderful example for, for Glenmar. Well, DC put the trip together, and I signed up. And I thought this was wonderful. I could get and actually be there with my own hands to do something. Well, the trip was in July, and this was the fall of 2005, so the trip was still quite a ways away. But what I found is, as the weeks turned into months, I just couldn't get this out of my mind, that I needed to be there. And it was a feeling that just didn't go away. Well, between then and uh, the trip in July, along came the big Hurley mission trip to Hurley, Virginia. Something happened to me on that trip that I wrote down in the Advent, Christmas Advent devotional guide that year, and I'd like to read this story to you. It's entitled, Flexibility. I've been told that the most important quality to have on a mission trip is flexibility. Despite the best planning, despite attention to detail, despite everything, things don't go as planned as you need to be flexible. This year on the Big Hurley trip, I think I learned what flexibility really means. From the start, nothing about this trip seemed to go right. It rained most of the way to Hurley, causing a nine-hour trip to turn into 11 hours. The late arrival meant pushing the schedule back, rushing through organizational information, getting to bed later than planned, and being that much more tired on Monday morning. Our project was to build a porch and ramps for Mrs. Blankenship, a very large project that would take time to complete. When we arrived at her house on Monday, we didn't have the right lumber. The posts were too short, too many decking boards, no structural lumber, and it was raining. We spent most of the morning in Mrs. Blankenship's tiny living room enjoying her hospitality, getting to know her, her son, and each other. As the rain continued, I was getting anxious to get to work. By the end of the day, all that we had accomplished was digging one post hole. I left that day feeling frustrated that we hadn't gotten more done and worried that we would not be able to finish the project that week. That night, DC talked about flexibility. Then someone mentioned the phrase, God is in control. And for me, it all clicked. We call flexibility going with the situation and making the best of circumstances. But that night, I realized flexibility means acknowledging and accepting the fact that we're not in control. God is in control. I always knew that God was in control of everything, but the problem was I was often forgetting it. I began to realize that the lack of lumber and the rain were blessings and not the unwanted delays that I had thought. Because of the rain, we spent Monday together as a crew getting to know the Blankenships. After all, the purpose of a mission trip is to build relationships with people, not just do the project. The rain was God's way of helping us to start with and focus on the people. The next day when we returned to Mrs. Blankenship's house, the sun was out, the necessary lumber was delivered, and on Friday we were blessed with four extra people to finish the project. Now when things don't seem to go right, I think about flexibility and remember that God is in control. That was a very important experience for me because in that trip, I was reminded of something that I often forgot. God is in charge. Well, we got back from Big Hurley that year and it was three weeks till the Slidell trip. And as I had said, my desire to go on that trip, that feeling, and I couldn't explain it, but that feeling to be there was just as strong as ever. So the trip left on a Saturday. So as is customary, the previous Sunday, six days prior to the trip, we all come to church. We're wearing our mission trip t-shirts. We come forward. Andy prayed for a safe and um, effective ministry trip. And at that time, DC mentioned, oh, and by the way, we've got an extra spot in the trip. So if anybody's not doing something next week, how would you like to come to Louisiana for the week? Don't necessarily expect to get any takers, but there was an extra spot. 
Well, after the service that day, somebody came over to me, someone who I didn't know, introduced himself as Joe Hoffman, and said, you know, I think maybe I can take off next week. I think I might be interested in this trip. Can you tell me a little about it? I thought it was kind of odd because Joe and I had never met each other. Why was he talking to me? Why not to DC, who's made the announcement, who was the leader of the trip? But nevertheless, Joe and I talked for a little bit. I introduced him to DC and, you know, didn't give it another thought. That was Sunday. On Tuesday, two things happened. The first is, word was Joe was definitely in. It was okay with his family. It was okay with his boss. They could take the time off. And at relatively the last minute, he joined the trip. Second thing that happened that day is I was diagnosed with bladder cancer. On Thursday, I found myself in the operating room. On Saturday, the trip shoved off Joe and DC and the rest of the crew without me. And boy, was I confused. You see, I thought this feeling I had to be there to do something, if it wasn't God calling me to be there, it was the closest thing I've ever had to that. And I learned in Hurley that God is in control. So it just didn't make sense. I didn't understand why I wasn't on that trip. I was confused. About three weeks later, I get a phone call from Ann Royster. Ann's one of the youth in the youth group. She said, hey, Mr. P, that's my youth group nickname. Mr. P, we just got back from Slide L, and there's so much to be done there. It will take years to rebuild that area. And I was talking with Brittany and Jessica and Katie and Hannah and Caroline, and the six of us, we don't want to wait till next summer to go back. We think maybe we can go back at spring break. We think maybe we can talk to some of our friends at church, talk to some of our friends at school, see if we can get people interested in going. We even thought we'd call our little group Youth on a Mission. And we really want to do this, and DC said, go for it. And then she asked, will you come with us? This coming spring break will be my fourth home trip to Slide L. I have no doubt whatsoever that God is in charge of my life. I really do think God was calling me to do something, to get up, use my hands and feet to help in New Orleans, to help in Slidell. God reminded me in Hurley just who is in charge. I think God wanted me there on that Yom trip, and maybe not on DC's trip. Now, you might say it was a coincidence that there just happened to be an extra spot in the trip. Or you could say it was a coincidence that DC just happened to mention it. After all, what's a chance somebody can join the trip at the last minute? Or you may say it was a coincidence that Joe just happened to come over to me. Neither of us knew, each, knew the other, introduced himself. You might say it was a coincidence that the day that I dropped out of the trip, Joe was in. Or you might say it was a coincidence that Ann Royster gave me a call and asked me to go with them. Those could all be coincidences, but I don't buy it. God was in charge every step of the way, and I have absolutely, positively, totally no doubt. The other thing that I learned that, that through that experience is God is in charge even if I'm confused, even if I don't understand yet what's going on, it doesn't mean that God isn't in charge. God's in charge of my life, but I'm not so special that I have corner of the market on God. God's in charge of your life. God's in charge of Glenmar. I have absolutely no doubt. And it's our responsibility. We are here to do God's will, to be God's hands and feet in the world. In fact, we pray that nearly every week. We just prayed that this morning. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We're the ones here to do God's will. 
Now the hard part. How do we know what God's will is? How do I know what it is for me? How do you know what it's for you? How do we as a church know what God's will is for us? I think the place to start is prayer. Glenmore is pretty good at praying as a church. Um, you know, nearly every meeting, never, nearly every gathering that we have here starts with and ends in prayer. There was a time when uh, being the lay leader wasn't such a, you know, had, had a little bit of a downside to it. Um, not too many years ago, um, the lay leader would walk into the room and you could just hear the sigh of relief because everybody knew if there was any praying to do, the lay leader was the one that was going to get to do it. <laughs> but that's changed. I mean, I go to a lot of meetings now, and I tell you, the pastors never get a chance to pray, even if they want to. They don't get a chance. I don't even get a chance to pray that much. We're a praying congregation. That's wonderful. But, you know, there's a couple different types of prayer. We can pray to praise God. We can pray to ask God for help. We can pray to intercede for God to help others. We can pray for, thanks, for thankfulness. And that's one that, you know, maybe sometimes I overlook a little bit. I'm so busy asking for things, I forget to say thank you. But we can also pray for guidance and discernment. The Reverend Billy Graham has said that prayer is really nothing more than a two-way conversation between you and God. And I think that's a great analogy. Because, you know, in any conversation, sometimes we do the talking, sometimes we do the listening. So, one way to discern God's will is to ask, and then be quiet long enough to listen for the answer. But, you know, wouldn't it be so much easier if God could just write down what He wants us to do? I mean, God probably has an iPhone 5, or maybe even an iPhone 6. Why couldn't He just send us a text message? Why couldn't God just Skype or post something on our Facebook wall? or even send us an email, or even a letter in the postal mail. Wouldn't that be so much easier? Wouldn't it be nice if um, you got a text message and you're checking your text message and says, uh, oh, hey, Glenmar, good job with that walk to Bethlehem. But don't forget to invite all those visitors back so we can get to know each other a little bit better. Sign God. Or wouldn't it be great to sit down at the computer and open up your email in the morning, and there's an email from God that says, Hey, Glenmar, good job with those summer mission trips, but what are your plans for the other weeks of the summer? It'd be so much easier if God wrote all this down. Well, the fact is, He did. Or more correctly, He inspired people to write it down, and we call it the Bible. All we really have to do is read it, but better than reading it is to study it, and the best way to study the Bible is in a group. You see, it's been my experience that I can read the Bible, but I often don't understand all that I'm reading. I have questions about things, but when I'm in a group, well, the first thing I realize is that when I'm in a group, other people have the same questions I do, so I don't feel quite so stupid. But the other thing is when you're in a group, you get other people's interpretations, other people's understanding, and together that gets me thinking. And really, I come out of a group Bible study feeling as if I'm understanding a lot more. Bible study is very important. So starting this week and every week, there'll be a little half sheet of paper out at the Welcome Center with the week's scripture on it and a couple questions. Please feel free to take one. Use it for your personal Bible study. Or use it, uh, take it to your group, small group ministry, small group gathering, and use it as an opening Bible study for your group. Prayer and Bible study together, two very important ways to, for us to figure out what God's will is. At Glenmar, our mission, as we all know, is praising God growing disciples, and serving the world. I am convinced that is exactly what God wants this church to be doing. And I'm convinced of that because all three parts of that come straight from the Bible. This morning, our call to worship talked about praising God. 
Paul read two scriptures today. The first, the 28th chapter of Matthew, the very closing verses of the book of Matthew, where Jesus is telling his disciples to go out and make disciples of all nations. That's our growing disciples. And then Matthew, the 25th chapter, talked about how when we serve others, we are serving God. And that's the serving the world part of our mission. At Glenmar, everybody is encouraged to be in ministry. In fact, we even sometimes use the term every member a minister. We have a lot of established ministries here. We really do. And we're always open to new ministries that are consistent with our mission. But, you know, the critical thing is to remember why we do ministry. We do ministry. When we serve in ministry, we do it to glorify God. Simple as that. In fact, as part of the youth group uh, mission trainings, DC has reduced it down to six words, which are really good. Our growth, others good, God's glory. When we do ministry, we grow in our faith. We grow as Christians. When we do ministry, we do it to benefit others. Others good. And when we grow in our faith and when we do things to help others, God can't help but be glorified in the process. It's my hope that everyone at Glenmar, whether you're here today or not, whether you're a member or not, that everyone here will commit to being in ministry of one form or another. It doesn't matter if your ministry is one hour a year or several hours a week. It doesn't matter if your ministry is sitting home serving on the prayer chain or whether you're going to a foreign country to rebuild homes and rebuild lives. All of those ministries are important. They're all valuable. They all serve God. Now, I want to make it very clear, and I want to say it very, very bluntly. I'm not telling a single person here that they need to be in ministry. I don't want to tell you. I'm not even asking you to be in ministry. Instead, what I hope is that you will gladly and joyfully want to be in ministry out of acknowledgement that God is in charge. We are here to be His feet and hands in the world and to serve other people. Perhaps you're feeling that uh, you may be called to praise God. Glenmar has many worship ministries. Or perhaps you're feeling that tug to to grow as a disciple, either to grow yourself as a disciple or to help others grow as disciples. Or maybe you're feeling called to be in service, and Glenmar has many mission opportunities, both locally as well as not so locally. So if you're feeling called to ministry, you'll notice in your bulletin this morning, there's a little yellow sticky note. You might want to jot something down just as a reminder. Everyone, uh, Hope, was offered a pencil when they came in. Take the pencil, take it home. It's yours to keep. Take that yellow sticky note, take it home. I don't want it, it's for you. It's to remind you, take it home, put it someplace. It's to remind you of just where you think you may be called to be in ministry. And then, of course, the key is don't forget to look at the note. Now, Not everybody knows where they're called, and that's fine. Not everybody here has to know where they're called to ministry. It's fine if you don't know where you're called. But may I suggest to you, the place to start is with prayer and Bible study. Yeah, I took my first Bible study class here, the Disciple One class, about 15 years ago. I had been reading the Bible, but I really didn't understand a lot of it. But that class really changed my life. helped me grow as a disciple. And the the thing is, I was growing as a disciple, and I didn't even realize it. Over the course of the year, and disciple one is a big commitment, it's 34 weeks, but over the course of the year, I was reading the Bible, understanding what I was reading, and was able to start thinking about how to apply it to my life. So, I was growing as a disciple. So, if you're not sure where you're called in ministry, prayer and Bible study is the place to start. You know, know, the three parts of our mission, praising God, growing disciples, and serving the world, in my mind, though they're all important, but in my mind, the key, the linchpin is the growing disciples. 
Because I'll tell you from my experience, as you grow as a disciple, praising God and serving the world just comes naturally. So in conclusion, I have no doubt that God is in charge of my life. He's in charge of your life, and He's in charge of Glenmar. And through prayer and Bible study, we can figure out and discern what God's will is for us. And then we need to act, to act and be God's hands and feet in this world. In closing, we ha I have a short uh, slideshow I'd like to share with everybody to celebrate some of Glenmar's ministries. I think on Laity Sunday, we should celebrate the ministries that this church does. We have a wonderful selection, wonderful arrangement uh, of ministries here. I think we really need to celebrate that. So keep your sticky note and your pencil handy. You might just see something on this slideshow that you might want to write down. I think we've got, uh, if I counted right, about 60 ministries. And I know I didn't get them all, and my apologies to the ones that didn't make it into the slideshow. To paraphrase a line from the Christian musical group Casting Crowns, may our life song always sing to God. Dear God, we acknowledge that you are in charge and that we are your hands and feet in this world. May our life song, both as individuals and as your church, always sing to you. Amen.